With the outbreak of war, militias from around the colonies began to form and attack British possessions in the South, North, and even Canada. We will get to these events later. For now, let's talk about the Siege of Boston. The Boston militia forces made it impossible for the British to resupply their forces from foraging and prevented land reinforcements. At this point, British control only amounted to the city of Boston and some of the smaller surrounding suburbs. The Patriot militias occupied the hills on all sides of the city. If the British were going to get reinforcements, they would have to get them from the sea. The militia had settled in on April 19th. 16,000 Patriots surrounded the city. Supply for the British was not a problem, though. The colonists had little to no heavy artillery, so the Royal Navy could quickly resupply the garrison by sea. The British then dug in and were able to deploy their own heavy cannons to combat Patriot positions. Over the next month, things became monotonous. Here is a basic idea of what events would happen. The British would bring reinforcements by boat. The colonists would try to stop it, but they did not have enough heavy artillery, so nothing really happened. Then the British could not break out of Boston because there were still 16,000 militiamen, far too many to even try to attempt to break out. There was an exception to this though. The British forces launched a raid to capture cattle and hay since they could not get any fresh beef and hay while in Boston. The colonists figured this out though and were able to fight off the raid before the British were able to get most of their goals accomplished. They only got a little bit of hay and a tiny bit of beef, but that's about it. As previously mentioned, there is one thing the British had that the colonists did not, and that was heavy guns. The British were able to fortify their parts of the city. Any attack by the Americans without any other kind of counter battery fire would prove to be difficult at best and suicidal at worst. Understanding this predicament, the Massachusetts Provisional Congress asked a man by the name of Benedict Arnold to raise a small force and then march them off into New York to capture the British-held Fort Ticonderoga, since reports said it was lightly defended. He marched off in early May. On his way there, he ran into Ethan Allen, who had raised a small force of militia to also seize Fort Ticonderoga. The two decided, well, shoot, we're both going there, why not do it together? And marched off. They were able to easily capture Fort Ticonderoga and Fort Crown Point, and in total found themselves in the possession of 180 cannons, howitzers, and mortars, loads of ammunition, and just other munitions. The capture of these forts and their supplies would single-handedly supply most of the forces for the beginning of the war. Something occurred to them, though. Sure, they had all these cannons here in upstate New York at Fort Ticonderoga, but they actually needed to transport them back over to Boston. Getting them there would be much easier said than done. We will get back to this predicament in a little bit. By late May, three British generals had arrived in Boston. There were now four British generals, and eventually by early June, 6,000 British soldiers, and that number kept increasing daily. With his new reinforcements, General Gage began to draw up plans to expand his control. He originally drew up plans to capture Dorchester Heights and Charlestown, but then decided to attack Charlestown first, and then Dorchester Heights if the attack was successful. Getting these areas under their control would allow for the British to push back colonial lines and put artillery batteries on even more advantageous positions. On June 15th, American intelligence got word of the impending British attack on Charlestown. The following day, Colonel William Prescott took 1,200 men and fortified the area he awaited their assault. In the afternoon of June 17th, British forces began their attack on the dug-in Americans. The day before, the Americans had been able to reinforce with another 1,200 men, which now their total men on this peninsula was about 2,400. This meant that the British would be going up against a well-entrenched force with a good amount of reserves. As the British advanced towards the colonists, legend has it that Israel Putnam was said to have given the order to his men. Men, you are all marksmen. 
don't fire until you see the white of their eyes. This was said to have been meant for them to save gunpowder, but truthfully, I am of the opinion that he just wanted to sound awesome. Anyways, the first British assault was met with furious resistance. The fortifications the colonists had set up included metal bars for their defenders to place their muskets on to make their accuracy better. This paid off in dividends. The British regulars were left out in the open, and while some were able to return fire, many were just cut down by gunfire. General Howe, seeing that this attack hadn't worked at all, called his men back. This time, instead of making any diversionary attacks, he would make it really, really simple. His men would assault the same positions and literally the exact same before. I know, simply brilliant. The second wave occurred much like the first. I could go into a lengthy description of what happened, but I believe this quote from a British soldier sums it up perfectly. Most of our grenadiers and light infantry, the moment of presenting themselves, lost three-fourths, and many nine-tenths of their men. Some had only eight or nine men in a company left. By this time, there was panic all across the battlefield. American soldiers were trying to desert, and British soldiers were trying to get all their dead and wounded back to their ships. General Howe decided to launch a third attack and received 400 fresh reinforcements from General Clinton back in Boston. This time, Howe formed his men up into columns to minimize the amount of men that could be killed by volleys, and then once again flung them at the colonial defenses. The third tech made it all the way to the defenses, and by this time the colonial forces had run out of ammunition. The British had their bayonets fixed, and close combat broke out along all the front lines. The Americans ordered a retreat, but the battles and fortifications really gave us some spectacular moments, including Colonel Prescott using a saber to parry British bayonets and being one of the last people to leave Breed's Hill. This last assault also saw the death of the American General Joseph Warren and Major Pitcairn on the British side, who led the British assault. With the Americans in retreat, the British had captured Charlestown and the rest of the peninsula. They had paid a heavy price, though. The British had suffered over 1,000 casualties. Many of these were officers, and in total, about a tenth of all the casualties were from the officer class. This depleted a significant part of the entire British officer class, not just there in Boston, but on the entire American continent. The Americans suffered about 450 casualties. This over 2 to 1 ratio stunned the British and made them rethink their entire strategy of the war. Going forward, they would augment their own manpower with Hessian auxiliary mercenaries from Germany. The British also decided not to attack Dorchester Heights because of the massive casualties here and what could possibly happen if they assaulted another well-fortified place with high ground. The Pyrrhic victory at Bunker Hill was the final major action during the Siege of Boston. About a month later, General George Washington arrived to take over the newly created Continental Army that had been formed out of the militias at Boston. Washington also received reinforcements and supplies, including riflemen. I will talk about the rifle and why it's important later on, but for now, just know that the rifle was the ace up the sleeve of the American forces. Remember Benedict Arnold? Well, he rode up to Washington's camp in late summer, informing him that the forts had been successfully seized and that there were tons of cannons there. Washington, Arnold, and a few other commanders held a meeting about them. During this time, it is said that a man by the name of Henry Knox threw out the idea of bringing them to Boston to help with the siege. Washington thought it was a great idea, and then proceeded to task Knox with accomplishing this logistical task. Knox rode off to Fort Ticonderoga. Washington then turned back and gave Benedict Arnold a new objective. He was to take 1,100 men and capture Quebec. Arnold accepted and left with his men to campaign in Canada. The rest of the summer, fall, and winter passed with a few raids here and there, 
but for the most part, another stalemate had settled in. Knox arrived at Fort Ticonderoga on December 5th, and over the next two months, he led a baggage train that contained 59 artillery pieces and mortars through the countryside in snow and ice to Washington's camp at Cambridge, Massachusetts. As soon as he received his artillery, Washington went and fortified Dorchester Heights. As you would remember, the British decided not to attack here last June. Big mistake. Washington put his cannons there and started bombarding the city. The British returned fire, but realized that there was no way the artillery would be able to reach Washington. Realizing the hopelessness of the situation, the British made the decision to abandon the city. They evacuated the city on March 17th, taking with them 11,000 people, including about 10,000 British soldiers. The Americans entered the city over the next few days. The siege of Boston was finished. The four British generals at Boston all had different outcomes. Thomas Gage would never again hold a command. General Howe would be sent to deploy the new army to capture New York. General Burgoyne was given the task of defending Canada from, now, Benedict Arnold's campaign. And General Clinton would remain as a general in America for the foreseeable future. The Americans were ecstatic. They had just driven off a British army, and it all seemed to be going well for the New Republic. Washington, though, was uneasy. Sure, they had just driven off the British, but he fully understood that the Empire would not let the war go so quickly. A few days after the siege of Boston ended, Washington told his army to pack up. They were moving to New York, where he predicted, correctly, that the British would try to strike next. There was also word of a British movement in the South. Back in January, General Clinton had left Boston with about 1,500 men. His destination was in the southern colonies, particularly the Carolinas. There, he was met with reinforcements, and a campaign began there. As previously mentioned, his people in the government thought this war would be over quickly. Others were warning of a much longer conflict. What everyone could agree on was that the siege of Boston had shocked the world. The American continent would never be the same. <laughs> 